Thank you for watching and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. When I was in high school, I had this good buddy of mine named Jeff. The two of us did a lot of things together. We were in a band, we did drama and comedy sports together. We went to college together. And in the time that we were really good friends, he introduced me to a bunch of cool things like uh, ska music, which we were in a ska band together. Uh, you can look that up if you want. Um, uh, X-Files, he was a big X-Files guy. And the biggest thing I'd say he was into was Marvel Comics. Really all comics, but Marvel specifically. And when we went to college together, he was obsessed with Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Now admittedly at the time, I had no interest in playing the game, mostly because he played it so much. But last year on the show, we did Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 around the time that Civil War got released. And I thought, I think it's time to go ahead and give uh, Ultimate Alliance 2 the spot that it deserves, considering that that is the Civil War storyline. And Spider-Man was in that movie, and that's kind of the reason why we have Spider-Man Homecoming that came out today. So take all that stuff aside, and take into consideration that Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 came out last year on the PS4 and Xbox One with the first game, and I thought, let's go ahead, it all just kind of aligns, like, like planets and stars and all that fun stuff. Today, we're gonna take a look at Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 for the PS4. Let's begin. Yes! Right. I've said it before, but it bears repeating now. Nowadays, if you're gonna make a Marvel video game, you'd best fall in line with the MCU. Everyone's favorite behemoth of a film franchise is easily Marvel Comics' most well-known, widely adored, and lucrative asset. So it makes sense for Marvel to ensure that its other properties play as nicely as possible with these films. Which explains why the vast majority of the Marvel toys and merchandise you find in stores today feature characters from that Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it also explains why, in more recent Marvel games, such as Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite coming out later this year, that there's an outright embargo on characters not lucky enough to find themselves under that umbrella. Pour one out for Magneto and the fam, y'all. But things weren't always like this. Like back in 2006, when Activision and Raven Software created Marvel Ultimate Alliance. With no movie universe to heed to, they were forced to come up with original silly-ass ideas of their own for the narrative and general direction of the game. And things seemed to work out for them, with Ultimate Alliance becoming a classic amongst fans. Fast forward a bit to 2009, when we were all teetering on the precipice of what would become the MCU. I Iron Man had just performed surprisingly well, promising far more ambitious projects to come along. And the Incredible Hulk... <laughs> ...happened. But there were still no movies to pull from when Activision was looking to dip into the Marvel pool once again for a sequel. And instead of creating another completely original premise, they found themselves drawing inspiration from the comics themselves. Crazy, right? They set out to adapt one of the most popular line-wide events in recent Marvel history, Civil War. And while everyone and their gram gram may be fully aware of that story's events today, it wasn't exactly common knowledge back then, making it pretty ripe for adaptation. That was only the first big change for Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. The game also had some new developers behind it, like a lot of new developers. There were three different versions of the game, released across a slew of consoles, with each one helmed by a different studio. The version for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in particular was developed by Vicarious Visions, and it boasted some serious improvements in audio and visual power. And now that the game has been ported to PS4, it'll be easier than ever to see how it holds up. And if the legions of bugs and glitches survive the transition to the sequel. It's a brand newish game, sure, but this is still a huge dungeon crawler that's bound to have copious amounts of grinding in store for potential completionists. And the only thing worse than grinding is having your deserved rewards for grinding not show up when they were supposed to. Like, look, I don't consider myself a bad guy or anything, but if this game doesn't reward me for completing it or glitches out or forces me to start over like the last one, I might give it to my base urges and start hailing Hydra. Oh, hail Hydra. What? Hail, uh, uh hail, 
Yo, Hydra? Ted, are you saying you're in Hydra? I, uh... No? Hi Hydra? God damn it, Ted, you're so bad at this! Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 is equal parts impressive leaps and bounds over its predecessor, and baffling choices that seem to be pulled out of a hat at random. No one can deny that this game is far more polished and, in many ways, more enjoyable than the first Marvel Ultimate Alliance, but some things left me scratching my head. First off, the game's story is ripped right out of the pages of the comic book version of Civil War, including Nick Fury leading a Black Ops mission into the heart of Latveria. You know, alongside his hand-picked squad of totally unrecognizable, uber-incognito superheroes that are just perfect for a secret mission. After busting up their targeted underground weapons ring and blowing up Castle Doom for good measure, the heroes return home after a job well done to enjoy hot dogs, burgers, and that special sense of satisfaction that comes from policing the world. Fast forward one year later, and Latvarian forces are trying to claim an eye for an eye by firing cannons right into the heart of Manhattan. The heroes manage to save the day before the biggest bombs can go off, but enough damage has been done to the Big Apple to make the public pretty peeved at the superhero community. The sh really hits the fan when a short time later, a group of young heroes known as the New Warriors incite an incident on live TV. They cause a bad guy called Nitro to go Katie kaboom in the middle of a suburban neighborhood, wiping out an entire US city. The US government can't stand for this no more, so they introduce the Superhero Registration Act, which would require all superpowered individuals to either become good little soldiers, retire, or be branded as outlaws. The superhero community is split into two, with Iron Man becoming de facto leader of the pro-registration forces and Captain America leading the underground rebellion. But of course, there's yet another unseen force out there that threatens the safety of the entire world. And with the little tip that's going on between the heroes, that force just might succeed. It's a strong premise with tons of promise for interpersonal conflict, and there are very few liberties taken with this version of the story. In fact, I think there may not have been enough liberties taken. For example, the game really takes its time getting to the actual Civil War, much like the comic book does. There are two full big-ass levels before our favorite characters start falling out with one another like the kids on Degrassi. That's a long time before we get to the good stuff of the game. Look, I understand that the game has to set up the circumstances for the events so that they can make sense for the player, but waiting so long for the hammer to drop was a little bit tedious. However, the fact that there are basically two different stories in Ultimate Alliance 2, depending on whether you side with the pro or anti-registration forces, is a huge plus. The events that go down in both scenarios are similar, but also different enough to make playing through the campaign a second time feel like a real treat. The upgraded cutscenes also make the narrative a bit easier to swallow. They're the cinematic sequences that are so pervasive in games today, as opposed to the awkward dialogue scenes from the first Ultimate Alliance, in which the characters would just stand awkwardly around, displaying all the worst parts of mocap technology. Just take a look at this. You're my exact double and you're making fun of me? Hmm. Maybe I'm not that bright after all. It's like a bunch of cousins that don't know each other who were forced to hang out with each other at Thanksgiving. While the soundtrack is entirely forgettable, the game's voice acting still goes a long way in characterizing the heroes. Well, don't get used to it. I'm only here because Stark told me he had some Cubans he just got in. Interacting with the NPCs and hearing their opinions is the most engrossing way to experience the narrative. The government's always wanted to take us down a peg. Now they see their chance. But Cap showed us what we need to do. Although I'd still love more specific dialogues between characters on your team. Imagine having Iceman and the Human Torch quip back and forth at each other like Legolas and Gimli. Gambit could have had a unique pickup line for each and every single female character in the game. You must like to play cards. I like solitaire, okay? Unless I got someone to play with. He's lovable because he has no shame. However, when communicating with NPCs outside of levels, you'll often be given a choice between several bits of dialogue. They fall into three categories, aggressive, diplomatic, and defensive. They'll affect how other characters interact with you throughout the game, and depending on who's chatting with whom, you'll sometimes come across secret, super specific character conversations that offer the kind of accurate characterization that we all crave. 
than may occur outside of the main gameplay, but I'll take it. The character models look miles better than they did in the previous game, complete with mouths that actually move and whatnot. What a time to be alive. But yet another example of the game taking an inexplicable step back are the character portraits. These things look like they were rendered at 240p. Did the developers forget to remaster this one set of assets? There are tons of characters to choose from when constructing your teams, but whereas the first game's roster was mostly made up of inarguable Marvel icons, this game has some weirder choices. Many of the people you'd expect to be here still are, but then you've got choices like including both Venom and Carnage on the roster. Did we really need that? Even if some of them were DLC? And then there's guys like Penance. Penance? I know he's pretty important in the Civil War storyline, but we've got glaring omissions here. Doctor Strange, what happened to you? I have to go now. My planet needs me. Now, it's impossible to please everybody when constructing a roster for a project like this, but it's interesting to see the developers make character choices to serve the story rather than building a story to fit the roster choices, like they did the first time around. Every one of these characters is cool in their own way, and there's some pretty decent variety among character archetypes, personalities, and power sets. The game's backgrounds look far cleaner and far more open than in the last game. You can actually tell what's going on, thanks to the extra open space and the increased visual fidelity. There's far more detail in each background, as opposed to the limbo of blackness that seemed to envelop the edges of every stage in the first game. But while the visuals are much improved, the lack of variety in locale still hurts a bit. There are far too many facilities, factories, and bases for my tastes. By the time you get to Wakanda, you want to stay there forever since it's just so different from everything else before it. This problem also might be exacerbated by the fact that everything seems a bit washed out and gray in Ultimate Alliance 2. Even the characters themselves seem like they were filmed with some harsh overhead lights. Not only does it make things look uninteresting, but in the heat of combat, it can be easy to lose track of the different types of enemies. Sometimes I even found myself confusing friends for foes in the melee. But there are far more important things to fight about between friends. You're blind on this one. If you're not gonna listen to reason, then this is over. Look, you, you keep moving the goalposts on this. Are you trying to find the truth or are you trying to be right? Stop playing devil's advocate. This is not rocket science. A hot dog is not a sandwich. Why not? Because a sandwich is two pieces of bread. Okay, okay, what about a Subway where technically it's still on oh one Oh my roll? god, you are missing the- Pat! I don't care! Did you play the first Marvel Ultimate Alliance? How about X-Men Legends 1 or 2? How about any action RPG dungeon crawler whatsoever? Because if so, you pretty much know what to expect from Ultimate Alliance 2. And even though there's a lot of mindless combat, some late game grinding, and a surprising lack of customization, this game is pretty damn amusing. The basic combat skills are pretty much unchanged from the previous game, including weak attacks, strong attacks, grabs, and blocks. You've even still got universal combo strings to temporarily take enemies out of the fight. And each character still has access to special powers like team-wide buffs, damage nullification, and everyone's favorite, beams that can melt a dude's face off from four yards away. But the guys at Vicarious Visions made some weird revisions to the way that abilities work. Now, each character only has four powers that they can actively use offensively. All of the rest of the skills are merely passive abilities. Sure, that's still plenty of customization potential in figuring out exactly where you want to invest your points, but this game could really use more ways to kill people. I feel like I had far more ability to create my own version versions of characters in the first Ultimate Alliance, considering that the gear system is completely removed, and especially since every character in Ultimate Alliance 2 has only one alternate costume. One! A lot of game companies tend to overemphasize cosmetics, and yet here I am, desperate for more options besides the Iron Spider. But there are some really inspired choices here, like the decision to do away with the screen-clearing panic button super moves from the last game. They've been replaced with fusion attacks, which are exactly what they sound like. Once you've earned a fusion star by beating up enough people, you can perform a fusion attack between any two of your team's heroes. They come in three varieties. 
Clearing fusions, which create a huge AoE blast to annihilate anyone within range. Guided fusion, which allows you to continue positioning yourself around the screen in order to hit multiple enemies. And targeted fusions, which drop massive damage on a single unlucky bastard. This system is a huge improvement over the first one, thanks to the increased variety and interactivity. Before, you'd press a button and all of your character supers would go off at the same time uncontrollably. Now, you've actually got to work a bit for your damage. And as everyone knows, hard-earned inflicted pain is the best inflicted pain. But I have to mention the trophy for performing every single fusion attack with every single possible character combination. The game requires you to pair up each and every character and perform their unique team-up move at least once. You'd think they'd include some type of checklist for that kind of thing, but no. I had to make my own Excel sheet to keep track of this monstrosity. If I have to bust out Microsoft Office in order to complete a game, you know things are getting bad. The different kind of fusion attacks force you to put some thought into your team composition. You wouldn't want to have a whole squad that can do nothing but targeted fusions, or else you'd get overwhelmed by hordes pretty quickly. Speaking of enemies, they're the exact kind of generic man fodder that you'd expect from a dungeon crawler. Just like with the last game, I'm a little disappointed with the lack of visual variety among the bad guys. One can only beat up on generic robots and bland soldiers for so long before getting bored. The bosses are spongy boys who almost always have a a gimmick or two up their sleeves, which require interaction with the environment in order to damage them. But I appreciate the developer's willingness to scrape the bottom of the barrel when casting their villains. This type of game is the perfect place to shine a spotlight on some of Marvel's more obscure characters and their wacky ass costumes. But the most interesting bosses of all are your former comrades. It hurts a bit to have to fight against people whom you know are cool dudes. These moments are when the drama of the Civil War story intersects most effectively with the gameplay. It's utterly gut-wrenching having to fight against your pal, Rhodey. Come on, man, I don't wanna do this. Wait, are you Terrence Howard or Don Cheadle in there? Don Cheadle, ah, oh, come on, man, I don't wanna do this. You still get stat bonuses when you construct specific teams of four, but another very nice quality of life change is that you can now revive fallen teammates and switch out characters without having to use an access point. This gives players a lot more flexibility with their teams and encourages frequent changing instead of just sticking with their favorites, which means that I can actually let go of you now, Spider-Man. But I'm not gonna. There are a bunch of different types of collectibles that you can find, such as boosts, which will instantly and permanently buff whoever picks it up. There are also health tokens, which you can earn for getting high scores during your fusion attacks. They're like the stockable emergency health pellets that you can use when you're one of your dudes is about to go down. But we're not done collecting crap yet. Let's say you want to learn more about the Marvel Universe while you play. Well, then the dossiers and audio logs are right up your alley, you big nerd. When you find them hidden all over the game and unlock others by completing in-game tasks, you can get a little more of a narrative fix. All the alternate costumes also require unlocking, and doing so is tied to each character's heroic deeds. Think of them like character-specific achievements, such as killing a bunch of enemies while aligned with a particular faction. Each character has three heroic deeds, with two rewarding you with passive stat boosts, and the last one unlocking their one alternate costume. All the things that could have been. The real problem with heroic deeds is how inconsistent they are with what they ask of you. Some of them are no sweat at all, like performing a specific move five times, but others require you to repeat entire levels with specific team comps. That may not sound like much, but repeated across 29 odd characters, it gets really tedious really fast. But let's not forget about the simulator missions, which are quick arcade-like missions that grade you on your performance. Once you find a simulator disc, you can activate them at the sim console and play through a short challenge for a bronze, silver, or gold medal. The challenges range from basic tutorials to combat challenges with diabolical modifiers. There are only 12, so obtaining gold across the board isn't as Herculean a task as it was in the last game. The trivia questions return from the first Ultimate Alliance, and they still can be pretty tough if you're not all boned up on your Marvel history. There's even a trophy for completing them all with a friend during multiplayer mode, so you're each forced to reveal to each other how much time you both spent memorizing comic book factoids. Collecting every single item and leveling every character and ability up to maximum requires multiple playthroughs. 
but a little planning and strategy is required since several characters become unselectable depending on which side of the registration act you align yourself with. My first pro registration playthrough was focused on playing through the game normally and becoming acquainted with it, but once you beat the main campaign, you unlock the hardest difficulty in the game known as Legendary Mode. The bad news is that things are rougher than ever on Legendary, but the good news is, is that all of your characters, abilities, and gain levels carry over, making my initial playthrough contribute toward my long, slow grind up to level 60 with each character. Legendary Mode is basically the same exact game, but with far tougher fights. However, if you choose to play through it from the opposite side of Marvel's Mason-Dixon line, there's still plenty of new stuff to enjoy. New dialogue, new characters, and new boss fights is more than enough to truly earn the title of New Game Plus. And even though this game does have multiplayer trophies, they're not that kind of multiplayer trophies. Back off, Competicus! Completing this game basically requires you to beat the entire game with at least one buddy. And with the added emphasis on teamwork in Ultimate Alliance, 2, a third run isn't that bad. Oh, and not to mention the fact that you still need to do plenty of grinding anyway. But just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, the glitches return in full force. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 isn't running rampant with bugs like the first game was, but instead there's just one massive disheartening glitch that I found. See, there's two checklists in the game, one on the simulator level select screen and one on the map statistics page. The first checklist is all good, but for some reason the latter list won't won't update to reflect certain accomplishments. This is supposed to be the proof that you're completing the game, so it's extremely frustrating for it to flip you the bird and act like you haven't been devoting yourself to it for several days. This thing says I'm missing collectibles when I know I've hunted down every single one. Some of the stats are thankfully reflected correctly elsewhere, but this right here just breaks my heart. Luckily, most of the trophies aren't that much of a headache. The majority of the stuff you have to go out of your way for aren't a problem when you're beating the game so many times, including having to beat each and every level without reviving any teammates. At the end of the day, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 is a pretty great way to play as a bunch of your favorite classic Marvel characters. Characters. The gameplay remains simple and solid despite the many lateral changes to the mechanics. Compared to the original, things are definitely more streamlined here, but there's a definite lack of depth too. In order to have more robust team combat, we had to lose alternate costumes and RPG micromanagement. It feels like every problem that's been eliminated is immediately replaced by two more. Like, like the heads of a Hydra. Yeah. Yo, hey, Ted, you are the worst sleeper agent I've ever met. I, I, Get off my mic. Okay, yes, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 rewards you for playing it, but the pickings are mighty slim. First off, there are just a few characters who have to be unlocked before you can use them. I'm not talking about the ones that are affiliated with pro-registration and anti-registration. No, these special little snowflakes require you to collect five items each before they'll join your team. To use Thor, the Hulk, and Jean Grey, you've got to find Asgardian runes, Gamma Regulators, and Mkron Fragments, respectively. They're spread all over the game, but there's ten of each, so the job isn't that tough. I see your game, Ultimate Alliance 2, keeping your heavy hitters behind lock and key, huh? Pretty sneaky, sis. Speaking of sneaky, once you've successfully beat the campaign for the first time, you'll unlock everyone's favorite surly plot device, Nick Fury. And there are even a bunch of codes to unlock all of the game's content from the get-go. You can get everyone's powers, tons of money, and all the alternate costumes. But once these codes are activated, saving will be disabled. But as far as 100% bonuses go, they're nowhere to be seen. You get nothing for beating every sim mission, you get nothing for unlocking Locking all the trophies, and you get nothing for grinding every single character up to max level. Games with this much completion criteria as these would instantly bump up in quality if they just acknowledged that there are plenty of psychotic individuals out there that would like to tear them apart. We're not asking for much, just a little acknowledgement or a little treat. Let us know that you know that we exist. This game is a good time, whether you're mindlessly mashing buttons alone or playing with a friend.
percent and if you're anything close to a fan of the marvel universe this game will leave you squealing with the amount of references and fan services packed into it and despite how much grinding is required to complete marvel ultimate alliance 2 it isn't nearly as much as what most other rpgs require and even though completing it didn't drain me too badly the utter lack of reward for doing it all leaves a pretty bad taste in my mouth like black licorice although i do want to add that when i beat the game on my second playthrough on the hardest setting i unlocked level select for all the levels in the game preventing me from needing to do a third playthrough however because i was under leveled and i had co-op multiplayer achievements left to do i ended up having to replay the entire game from beginning to end thus doing a third playthrough in my playthrough of marvel ultimate alliance 2 there were three total campaign playthroughs 12 simulator gold medals earned 59 trophies unlocked 60 levels gained per character with every character 47 hours and 32 minutes of total playtime 526 collectibles collected and one bun making it not a sandwich alex you are lost marvel ultimate alliance 2 is on the leaner side of rpgs making it a bit more attractive to completionists however walking away from the whole experience with nothing to show for it even with all of the game's badass qualities makes it something you may not want to invest that much into marvel ultimate alliance 2 does a lot of good things for the Ultimate Alliance franchise, if you will. It has better gameplay, it's a lot cleaner, graphically it's more impressive, but it takes a lot out from the first game. It takes out things like multiple costumes, it takes out multiple move sets, and unfortunately there are bugs in this game that will drive a completionist to go crazy. Admittedly, I think this game is better than the first game, but that isn't saying much considering how much was removed from the overall product. Completionists beware, this game may make you go crazy, so I recommend playing the originals on the PS3 or the 360. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you're new here and you like today's episode, leave me a thumbs up. Leave a comment in the box below. Let me know what Marvel games you want me to play next here on the show. And hey, if you missed last week's video on Crash Team Racing, uh, you can give that a click right in the box down below. My name is Sherrard the Completionist. You can follow me on social media, all that fun stuff. And I have to be at Indie PopCon. If you're at Indie PopCon, say hi to me. Give me a high five, all that fun stuff. I'll see you guys there. Have an awesome weekend. Enjoy Spider-Man Homecoming. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.